I'm Davis. I'm editor of MPA News and project supervisor for OpenChannels.org. Also with me is Sarah Carr, coordinator of the EBM Tools Network, and she's handling the technical side of this webinar. This webinar is a joint initiative with the MPA Action Agenda. The MPA Action Agenda provides a toolkit for those who seek more information on ocean protection at www.mpaaction.org. This webinar will provide a background briefing on the negotiations currently underway toward a new treaty to protect the biodiversity of the high seas, the role of MPAs in that, and the relevance of the UN bottom trawling resolution under review in August 2016. This is how the webinar will work. Our presenters will provide their PowerPoints and the audience will see each speaker's presentation on your own computer screen. Then we'll open the floor to questions from you, the audience, for the remainder of the webinar. And we'll conclude the webinar about an hour and a half from now. If you have a question for our presenters, uh, you can submit it in the question box that's on the control panel on your screen. We will be drawing from those questions throughout the Q&A session. Uh, we'll get started. Christina Jurdy is Senior High Seas Advisor to IUCN's Global Marine and Polar Program and an adjunct professor at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies in Monterey, California. Since 2001, Christina has published widely and helped catalyze multiple initiatives to advance the science, law, and policy related to marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction, including the World Commission on Protected Areas High Seas MPA Specialist Group, the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition, the High Seas Alliance, Global Ocean Biodiversity Initiative, the Sargasso Sea Alliance, and the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative. <laughs> Christina's been very busy. Uh, this is Christina Jurdy. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. And the reason for listing all those organizations was basically a plug to try to get many of you, as many of you to join as possible. That there's plenty of science, law, policy, economics, uh, research that needs to be done, and a lot of voices that need to be heard. So we hope you will join us in, in the call. Uh, at the end. Um, my task today, or my good fortune, is to talk about why it's time for a high seas treaty, why it is high, high time for a high seas treaty. Uh, as you see from the first illustration, the Earth from space, it's pretty cliche right now, but it is easy to see why we truly are an ocean planet. And if I can figure out how to... Sorry. Um, and that the high seas is providing us with a wide range of goods and services, many of which we take for granted, and many of which we're only beginning to be able to put a monetary value with. But the biodiversity that is out there is truly invaluable in terms of providing a space and habitat for all of us on this planet. That's this map of the ocean from the census of the marine life encapsulates 10 years of scientific investigations into the distribution, diversity, and abundance of marine life on this planet Earth. That I'm fascinated by this map, by these tiny little swiggles across the Pacific Ocean Basin that represent 22 different species that they're able to tag and track and home in on areas of particular ecological or biological significance. We're now able to use this information to document where species go and what they do and to help prioritize areas in need of conservation. The pictures at the top show the amazing array of creatures in the high seas water column um, and in the mid-ocean water column. And then below, we are still discovering new ecosystems, new habitats, and new entire new genera. Uh, this next picture shows the uh, increasing footprint of humankind on the marine environment. Uh, research done through the Census of Marine Life that helped to document that, yes, we have been putting too much into the marine environment for decades, starting in the 1950s, where we used it as an active repository for nuclear wastes. Um, but then in the 1950s to 2000, it was a great site for exploitation, which we unfortunately led to over-exploitation as the strongest impact. Now in the 21st century, we are truly starting to see and feel, here where it's 93 degrees, the impacts of climate change on the ocean and on the planet. And what the scientists are telling us in this paper by Ramirez Rodra is that climate change will soon start to be a dominant force 
in ocean ecosystems and that these little squiggles are showing where e impacts are amplified and synergistic given that um, stratification is worsened by sewage, worsened by nutrients in the marine environment. But of course our ocean, even though it's interconnected, is not treated as one. It is divided into legal zones. Uh, the blue and the red are areas, the exclusive economic zone within 200 nautical miles of states. The red is the seabed um, area of some coastal states who are fortunate to have jurisdiction over the seabed mineral resources and the sedentary resources. But everything that is beyond that is areas beyond national jurisdiction, A, B, and J, our favorite buzzword, uh, is international seabed area and the high seas are the water column above. When many of us use the term high seas, we actually mean it to um, reference high seas and areas beyond national jurisdiction, international seabed area. That, of course, the overarching legal framework that is guiding states' behavior in the high seas is the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. It's been supplemented twice through implementing agreements with respect to uh, deep seabed mining as well as fishing for highly migratory and straddling fish stocks. It was found that even though the Law of the Sea Convention provides this framework, the Constitution for the Oceans, it's not a perfect instrument. It needed to evolve to reflect the needs and demands of the time. So what many of us are asking for is a third implementing agreement under the law of the sea to address the weaknesses and, and um, gaps in high seas governance, as well as trying to start creating a coherent whole out of this panoply of international organizations with a remit it with respect to activities or conservation in areas beyond national jurisdiction. The areas on the right, the RFMOs, International Maritime Organization, International Seabed Authority, these are the organizations with responsibility for managing specific activities. They have regulatory power, but they often don't have high seas biodiversity conservation as a priority concern. Conservation is the remit of the bodies on the left, the Convention on Biological Diversity, Regional Seas Conventions, but they don't have the power to regulate specific activities. And that is why many of us are concerned about how to fit marine biodiversity, conservation, as well as sustainable use into this larger mix. Conservation organizations are not alone in calling for reforms in how we're managing the oceans. This um, picture shows the cover from the report, the first global integrated marine assessment, where the scientific experts involved are basically ringing the alarm bell saying, we have all these new threats and existing threats and old threats to the ocean, but we really need to be able to deal with all of them and deal with them quickly if we're to, going to try to ensure long-term conservation and sustainable use. Which means with respect to areas beyond national jurisdiction that we really need to address the governance gaps that is hindering the ability of states to come together to integrate biodiversity considerations into how we manage the global ocean. When you start to think about what Eleanor Ostrom and others have been writing about global commons and management, they're basically saying three criteria, three ingredients you need, which is the shared responsibility, conditional access, and effective enforcement. And that is what we're trying to bring for this greatest global commons on Earth, our global ocean. And that's what we're here to talk about today. And just one Last plug is on Thursday, Friday of this week, for those of you going to the International Marine Conservation Congress up in St. John's, Canada, we will be having a chance to go more fully into depth on all these um, issues as well as what we're discussing here today. And back over to you, John. Thank you very much. Thanks, Christina. That was a great introduction. Um, I also liked your, your Wild West photo. <laughs> um, all right, Peggy Callis is our next speaker. Uh, she is the coordinator of the High Seas Alliance and has practiced international environmental law for 25 years with both private law firms and NGOs. New York based for the last 15 years, she's worked and lobbied on behalf of, in, <clears throat> on behalf of uh, environmental NGOs on ocean and global governance issues at the UN and other international fora. 
From 2005 to 2011, Peggy also served as the UN coordinator for the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition in its campaign to halt destructive deep sea fishing practices. This is Peggy Callis. Thanks so much, John, and thanks MPA Action Agenda and MPA News and Network and, and all of you for joining us here today. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. My presentation will provide some background about the UN process and how we arrived at where we are today, as well as uh, the next steps through 2017 um, in the treaty negotiation process. Um, to Oops, just trying to get the right slide there. So first, I wanted to just briefly mention about who we are at the High Seas Alliance. We were established in 2011, and we are an international coalition with membership uh, that includes 32 of the leading NGOs working on ocean issues, um, as well as IUCN, which is an intergovernmental organization. Um, our members are involved in a variety of ocean and, and broader environmental issues, with some focused on campaigning and advocacy, some are legal and policy oriented, and some of our member organizations are comprised of marine scientists. But we've all joined together because we recognize the critical need to protect and improve high seas ocean governance. And in particular, we are focused and calling for the establishment of this new marine biodiversity agreement, which is sometimes referred to as the implementing agreement or instrument or treaty. It's all synonymous and under the UN, and it's all would be under the Convention on the Law of the Sea. So. A little bit difficulty changing the slides. They want to go too quickly. Uh, uh, current legal regime. I can't seem to get the slide to stay on. There we go. Okay. So as Christina mentioned, the governance framework for the areas beyond national jurisdiction, its legal rules and political processes, is based on the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS. And um, what we're really speaking about are those area, area, ocean areas beyond any one nation's jurisdiction, which are shared among all of us, every nation and every individual. And because the Law of the Sea Convention was negotiated in the 1970s, it has not kept up with the challenges and technological developments of the 21st century. Uh, Christina also touched on this, but I'll just briefly mention again that it needed to be expanded upon shortly after um, it was uh, adopted with two other implementing agreements, the UN Fish Stocks Agreement and Part 11 pertaining to the area, establishing the International Seabed Authority for Deep Seabed Mining. And again, this the agreement that we're talking about now would be the third implementing agreement to UNCLOS. So again, Christina spoke about the gaps under UNCLOS. Um, why do we need another treaty and what are the gaps in coverage? Um, I won't go into the details too much, but just to review, um, under UNCLOS currently there is no coordinating mechanism for the establishment, monitoring, and enforcement of marine protected areas. There's no coordinating mechanism for conducting a review of environmental impact assessments. There's no regulation of new and emerging uses, which happens, it seems to be lately, at an almost daily rate. Um, and there's no management of impacts, including cumulative impacts across sectors. It's also been slow progress on implementation of modern environmental principles, like the precautionary principle and ecosystem-based management. And unlike many other global conventions that were adopted in the past 20 years, like the UNF, uh, uh, C and CBD, UNCLOS did not establish a separate secretariat or conference of the parties tasked with monitoring its implementation or to monitor performance of states. And I'm trying, sorry, just trying to, this, uh, okay. So recognizing this, um, the discussion on how to address these gaps in areas beyond national jurisdiction have been going on for over a decade within the auspices of the UN ad hoc informal open-ended working group on biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. It's a very long <laughs> uh, uh, title and we fondly call it the BBMJ working group. Formed in 2004, uh, the initial, initial working group meeting took place in 2006 and met almost yearly 
Um, and then in 2011, there was significant progress uh, when the ad hoc working group identified key issues or package elements to be addressed in any future dis discussions related uh, to the new treaty. These four elements include marine genetic resources, including the sharing of benefits, area-based management tools, which includes marine protected areas, environmental impact assessments, and capacity building and technology transfer. They also decided that at, at that time that these elements would be considered together and as a whole, meaning that any discussion must happen in lockstep fashion and all four elements must be part of the new instrument. The High Seas Alliance is strongly focused on the environmental aspects of the treaty. And in particular, we are calling for the new instrument to establish a global system of ecologically representative, connected, and effectively managed marine protected areas, including marine reserves, in areas beyond national jurisdiction. And Christina uh, will address MPAs a bit more uh, in her presentation shortly. shortly. For environmental impact assessments, we're also seeking a way to operationalize the requirements to undertake and report on EIAs that is already provided under UNCLOS under Articles 204 through 206, and also take into account cumulative impacts and involve all stakeholders, including civil society. Let's see. Oops. OK, so building on the 2011 package agreement, uh, in 2012, at the Earth Summit in Rio, government leaders committed to a deadline of September 2015 for a decision on whether to launch negotiations for a new instrument on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Then in uh, January, uh, January, uh, 2015, this led to a, an historical breakthrough at the final BB&J Working Group meeting. Um, and these photos were actually taken that evening and demonstrate the intensity and the, the passion of the negotiations as governments reached an impasse. And then finally, late into the evening, um, they uh, led and championed by many governments who, who already recognize the need for this treaty, agreed by consensus to recommend that the UNGA launch negotiations for this legally binding international instrument. And you can see this was about 3 a.m. in the morning, and, and everyone was cheering when, when uh, agreement finally was reached that night. Shortly after that, in June 2015, oops, there we go, oops. Slides just do not want to stay. Sorry. There we go. Oh. Okay. Uh, in June 2015, Resolution 69292 was formally adopted by the UN General Assembly. And the resolution sets forth a timeline and established a series of preparatory committee, or what we call PREPCOM meetings, to take place in 2016 through 2017. And if you'd like to see an actual copy of this resolution, there's a link on the slide um, to view that. Um, the preparatory committee is actually composed of all UN member states wanting to participate. And they will make recommendations on the elements of text of the agreement, which are being negotiated through these series of PREPCOMs. We had our first PREPCOM in late March through April 8th, and the next one is approaching very soon, taking place August 26th through September 9th. And for 2017, the dates have not yet been determined. show you the timeline. Sorry, having technical difficulties with the way the view is showing on my computer, so I'm not able to scroll down as easily as I would like on the timeline. Um, I think. Um, but by the end of 2017, the Prepare Committee is to report to the General Assembly on its progress and by September 2018, decide whether to convene a formal treaty conference to finalize text and set a date for the conference. So we're likely look, uh, looking to around 2019-2020 at the earliest that a new treaty would come into effect. I'll stop at this point, but we'll be back at the end to speak about the next steps as we look towards the upcoming PREPCOM. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks very much, Peggy. Uh, next up, we have Matthew Gianni. 
Uh, Matt is co-founder of the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition, a coalition of over 70 NGOs and fishers organizations worldwide formed to promote UN General Assembly action to protect deep sea biodiversity and ecosystems. He is currently the political and policy advisor to the coalition and a partner in two of the EU's deep sea research projects, the MIDAS Project and ATLAS Project. Matt is also a member of the steering committee of the Global Oceans Forum. This is Matt Gianni. Matt, are you there? Matt, you're muted. Yeah, Matt's muted. Uh, you're you're self-muted, so uh, you need to unmute yourself. And uh, there's a um, a button in the user interface. There's a a green microphone. All that I think it's probably not green once you're muted. Uh, that you can click on to unmute yourself. Should we skip forward to David? Uh, yeah. Yep. Maybe move on. To and then David. come back to Matt. Okay. okay yeah. David. Uh, um. Oh, did I hear another voice in the background? Okay. Uh, Thanks. No. Thanks, and, Matt, Sarah. Okay. Uh, all right. I'll introduce David. Uh, David Freestone is the executive secretary of the Sargasso Sea Commission, appointed by the government of Bermuda, uh, pursuant to the 2014 Hamilton Declaration on Collaboration for the Conservation of the Sargasso Sea, signed by the governments of the Azores, Bermuda, British Virgin Islands, Monaco, the UK, and the US. He is also founding editor of the International Journal of Marine and Coastal Law, now in its 31st year an adjunct professor and visiting scholar at George Washington University Law School in Washington, D.C., and has published widely on the law of the sea and international environmental law. This is David Freestone. Yes, good morning. Thank you very much for the intro, John, and delighted to be here and to, to share some thoughts about the work which we've been doing for the last six years or so on uh, seeking to, to uh, conserve the Sargasso Sea. So what I'll do is say a little bit about where it is and why it's important. And I'll explain the work of the Sargasso, I call it the Sargasso Sea Project, because we started off as an alliance and now have, have morphed into a, a commission, an international commission, and then a few findings which sort of, I think, point the, highlight the need for, for us to have a, some fairly major changes in the, in the current regime that we have for the high seas areas, which our previous speakers have talked about. So this is where it is. It's in the, the North Atlantic subtropical gyre around uh, Bermuda, there's Bermuda's EZ in the middle there, and this is the area that we're interested in is the is, is the high seas area, so it excludes the EZ of, uh, of the neighboring countries. Uh, and as I say, it's gyre, like the North, like the North Pacific gyre, so uh, plastics are accumulated in the middle of the gyre, but also, more importantly, uh, so is sargassum. This is a, a holopelagic seaweed, that's one of the few that uh, reproduces without contact with, with the ground. Uh, and so it uh, uh, provides like a coastal ecosystem, but more than 200 miles from, from the coast. So it's a unique system. Uh, so I guess the Sea Project was set up in 2010 with the leadership of the government of Bermuda. Um, first of all, to achieve international recognition of the importance of the Sargasso Sea, to put it back on the map. I mean, m many people, most people have heard of the Sargasso Sea, but the first question often is, where is it, which is why I've addressed that as the first, as the first slide, and then to work with in existing organizations, national organizations and sectoral organizations, to get protection of the Sargasso Sea in accordance with the Law of the Sea Convention. So on the premise that the Law of the Sea Convention might provide an adequate regime for protecting high seas areas, uh, let's see if we can do it. We're the first to actually try that. And then, as the third bullet there is to use this experience to reflect on whether it's the current regime is actually adequate to do this. So back to the to the, the Sargasso Sea itself, that's a picture taken by Sylvia Earle, oh, actually a very large uh, Sargasso map. Um, it's as a unique open ocean ecosystem, important for the life of a large number of sea of species. Some pictures of endemics that actually live within the Sargasso, which are uh, unique to the Sargassum system itself, so they, they're uh, um, 
adapted to, to live within it. A lot of species like billfishes, turtles, tunas, and whales actually live within that system, benefit from, uh, from, from it and their migrations. Uh, and it provides, it's, I, for the fisheries people, it's like a, a huge uh, fishery aggregation device. If you float anything in the ocean, fish can sit underneath it. And here we have examples of large numbers of different fish, many of them quite commercially important, like uh, uh, Dorado, the mahi-mahi, and wahoo, and tunas. And it's also a little ecosystem for the protection of the young turtles in their lost years before they mature. So a, a, a unique system. And perhaps the most important, uh, it's difficult to call eels iconic, but they are amazing. They're, they live most of their life in brackish and fresh waters in Europe and North America, and then they migrate to the area south of Bermuda where they spawn and die. Never been witnessed. Um, it's a real wonder of the, of the high seas, I think, but it's the eels are in trouble. They're in 10% of historic, uh, historic catches. Uh, and there may be some connection with the Sargasso Sea uh, conditions uh, as, a you know, as a result of that. Um, the sort of threats that it faces are the ones that most ocean areas face. So I'm just going to go through all those, but you can see the climate change and ocean acidification. There are possible threats of mining as well as fishing and pollution. And so in 2014, after about three or four years' work trying to uh, put measures in place to protect the Sargasso Sea, um, we convened a meeting in Bermuda, the ha Hamilton meeting, uh, primarily intergovernmental, but with a lot of support from observer organizations and from NGOs, um, 11 governments there, of, which, of whom five, um, now six governments actually signed the Hamilton Declaration on Collaboration for the Conservation of the Sargasso Sea. So the Azores, Bermuda, the British Virgin Islands, Monaco, the United Kingdom, the United States. And the other countries there, the other governments there are still uh, fellow travelers and, and supporters. The Bahamas, which is likely to sign fairly soon, the Netherlands, Sweden, South Africa, and, and the Turks and Caicos, as well as the Dominican Republic, and Trinidad. There's fairly light structure. We have a meeting of signatories. We've met twice. And then we've established a Sargasso Sea Commission. These are appointed on the recommendations of the signatory governments by uh, the government of Bermuda. These are voluntary. They meet virtually. And their job is what we call basically stewardship. So their job is to keep the health of the ecosystem under review and to pro make proposals to the signatories for implementation. Then we have a, a fairly modest secretariat based here in Washington, D.C. at the IECN office, together with financial mechanisms to support it. That's our current uh, current commission. We have representatives there in their own capacity, but they're the U.S., uh, U.K., U.K., Canada, the Bermuda, and from uh, the Azores. Um, the work program of the Commission has been looking at, it's highlighted the six areas that it needs to work on, the importance of the Sargasso Sea, the impacts of fisheries, and impacts on habitat, impacts from international shipping, and then to the seafloor, and conservation of migratory species, and then also to provide a, a date, uh, like a clearinghouse data and information management system. So that's what we've tried, been trying to do. I can talk about specific activities, if you like, uh, in, in question time. Uh, we started off with a summary science case in 2011, which sort of reviewed state of the art. Uh, in 2012, it was actually described uh, as, a, uh, as a, uh, an EBSA, an ecologically, biologically significant area, the largest of its kind at this point, 2 million square miles. And these, to give you some idea of the diversity of the bodies that we've had to deal with in order to, to uh, put in place measures that are um, to conserve an area of the high seas, these are the, the numbers of bodies that we actually have had fairly important interactions with. So we can't really talk about a unified system. Uh, those bodies which have, having said that, there are the, uh, those bodies which have actual conservation powers are very limited indeed. Looking at that big, big list, for example, the con ICAT, the Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas, regulates fishing for the tunas and tuna-like species, the International Maritime Organization on Vessels and Vessel Source Pollution, uh, the Seabed Authority on uh, Seabed Exploration and Mining, and that's basically it. The others, well, I've had advisory jurisdiction or much more regional competence. Uh, so what are the lessons that we've learned from these nearly six years of work? As I said, not an easy chance. No one's tempted to do this, so in a sense we're we're forging the way on this, but we've also highlighted some of the inadequacies of the current system. 
There are only a limited number of competence authorities, as I mentioned. The fisheries organizations, I should have mentioned NAFO, perhaps as well, the Northwest Atlantic Fisheries, but that's two fisheries organizations, NAFO and ICAT, the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, and the Seabed Authority. And they don't talk to each other, so there's very little coordination between these competent authorities, despite the actual uh, 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 instruction in Article 197 of the Convention that the countries who are part of these organizations should coordinate their actions. So some of these states are actually the same. The same states go to the IMO, that go to ICAP, the same states go to NAFO, that go to the CBAT Authority. But the treaty requirements for different types of activities are, complete, are very different indeed. So IMO, for example, has the ability to establish particularly sensitive sea areas. I mean, even the jargon is pretty complex. It's alphabet soup of uh, acronyms. So the particularly sensitive sea areas, they also have the ability to establish special areas, different criteria for those different types of, of, uh, of protected areas. Fisheries organizations have the ability to establish closed areas and to establish and to protect vulnerable marine ecosystems, different criteria again. And then the, the, uh, the Seabed Authority is very welcome that it's, it's established areas of particular environmental interest, but again, the criteria are different, different measures, different, so very, very sectoral. And there are different concerns. Academic communities with experts that go to those meetings have very sectoral uh, perspectives. We had hoped that the CBD, uh, that it's the program of, of ecologically and biologically significant areas, would actually have the potential to be an overarching body, that it would actually, the other, the other bodies would actually look, at, look to those criteria and look at, say, an area like the Sargasso Sea and say, well, this has been decrypt, des described by the by the parties to the CBD as being an area of biological, ecological significance, maybe we should do something to protect it. Stories of some resistance not happening. So uh, I think Peggy mentioned the ecosystem approach and precautionary approach. Our experience has been that just, there's a lot of resistance to this. Um, there are these, these principles form part of the basic legal framework. Having said that, there's a lot of resistance. Within ICAT, for example, they're actually requiring us to show negative impacts on of fishing on the ecosystem, which is not a precautionary approach. This is more preventive. If there are negative impacts, there's already a breach of, of the convention. And similarly, if you read the PSSA guidelines, they do it. They don't seem to, this is for the establishment of particularly sensitive sea areas, the IMO, these, these again, do not seem to be embracing a, a uh, a precautionary approach, and actually the parties themselves uh, are reluctant to, to take those steps. So these two sort of, these, these basic ideas are not being implemented. So the next uh, point then is that intersectoral communication is very weak. As I mentioned, the bodies that have, have um, protective powers, they talk different languages, not, uh, you know, in terms of scientific terms. Uh, they have different communities and they have different procedures. And so I think, you know, our, our basic recommendation, our finding from this is that there is a need for a, a more systematic, holistic approach to governments of areas beyond uh, A, B, and J. We don't have to sweep away what really exists, both the regional and existing global structures will be necessary, but we need to have some overarching framework which will hold these things together and to introduce a more systematic approach to uh, ICs governments. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, my understanding is that we have audio on uh, on Matthew uh, now. Uh, Matt, are you there? Uh, yes, I am, John. Can you Excellent. hear me? Excellent. Yes, yeah. can hear you loud and clear. Uh, so as I said before, Matt is co-founder of the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition, a partner in two of the EU's deep sea research projects, MIDAS and ATLAS, and a member of the steering committee of the Global Oceans Forum. This is Matt Gianni. Okay, well, thank you, John. <clears throat> uh, what I'll be talking about uh, is the relevance of... Uh, Actually, uh, are, we, are we seeing Matt's presentation? I'm, it, the system is not making Matt presenter. I'm not seeing oh, his presentation. Oh, now it is. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, sorry, it, it was now. It wouldn't do it before. Okay. Okay. Thanks, sir. Anyway, I'll be presenting here on a uh, on a, a set of negotiations that's been underway for the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, for protecting uh, biodiversity in deep sea areas uh, uh, of the high seas from the harmful impacts of fishing. Um, 
Let's see, I hope I don't have the same problem that Peggy did. I don't seem to be able to change the uh, uh, the um, slides here. Well, you had the presentation up for a while. Sometimes it gets stuck. Uh, if you take it out of presentation mode and then put it back in, sometimes that uh, retoggles it and it works. Yeah, it seems to be stuck here. Um, or close PowerPoint and then maybe just start it up again. And if not, um, I don't have your presentation downloaded yet. I can work on that. Okay. Well, I can just talk it through, but let me open this back up again, see if it works, and then... Uh... We'll take it from there. Okay. Okay, here we go. Good. So this is the membership of the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition. On this slide, it's uh, we have over 70 members, uh, many of whom, in fact, are uh, also members of the High Seas Alliance that uh, Peggy Callis and, uh, and Christina Jardy mentioned. Um, the, as I think some of the, the um, your viewers will know, the um, United Nations uh, engaged in a quite a significant debate over the course of about 2001-2002 through to this year on managing deep sea fisheries in the high seas to protect deep sea <laughs> ecosystems from the harmful uh, impacts of bottom trawling and other forms of bottom fishing. And that debate was characterized not just by concerns over sustainable fishing or deep sea species, but biodiversity conservation, equity, you know, who has the right to go out there and fish and what obligations do they have to the international community as a whole, governance and the uh, implementation or rule of international law. Um, a series of four UN General Assembly resolutions was adopted calling for specific actions uh, to protect biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction from the harmful impacts of fisheries. Uh, and the core agreement basically was that states that do allow their vessels to go out and do this sort of fishing will prevent, will manage the fisheries to prevent significant adverse impacts on vulnerable marine ecosystems and ensure sustainability of deep sea fish stocks through um, uh, conducting prior environmental impact assessments of deep sea fisheries to determine what the impacts may be and if those impacts are deemed to uh, constitute significant adverse impacts, they will uh, establish mitigation measures or I'll prohibit the fishing. Precautionary area closures of vulnerable marine ecosystems to, sure that, to ensure that damage does not, is, does not occur. Uh, sustainable catch and bycatch of deep sea species and something called the Muon Rule, which I won't go into here. So we've done a review of the 10 years uh, since 2006 when the first of the uh, UN resolutions uh, was adopted calling for those specific sets of actions, specific set of actions that I mentioned in the previous slide. And the conclusions we've come to are there are some significant shortcomings in the implementation of the resolutions. Let me uh, hasten to add here that it, there has been some real progress made. A number of areas of the high seas are now closed to bottom fishing, in particular bottom trawling, to prevent damage to deep sea corals, deep sea sponge beds, coral gardens, xenophyophores, cold seats, and a whole range of uh, ecosystems in the deep sea uh, that are uh, defined or are characterized as being vulnerable to ecosystems. Uh, but there are still some major shortcomings. Um, on the question of impact assessments, they, many of them are inadequate or partial at best with lots of scientific uncertainties. Uh, mapping, which is called for in the guidelines for the implementation of these, uh, these impact assessments has not been done in many cases. And there are unverified assumptions of risk uh, and, and rather restricted in interpretation of what constitutes a vulnerable marine ecosystem and therefore what needs to be protected. And of course, uh, I think Christina mentioned it earlier, or Peggy did, um, the GA, the UN resolutions had called for cumulative impact assessments, and by and large, these have not yet been done. Um, some areas where vulnerable marine ecosystems are known to occur remain open to bottom fishing. Some areas, uh, many areas have been closed, but some are, are still open, even though it's been demonstrated that there are uh, uh, ecosystems that are, that are vulnerable to deep sea bottom fishing. And while in some cases representative areas of these vulnerable marine ecosystems have been closed to bottom fishing, and I'm thinking particularly in the northeast Atlantic 
and in the southeast Atlantic by the regional fishery management organizations in those areas. Um, there's been a general reluctance to apply the precautionary approach to closing areas where VMEs or vulnerable marine ecosystems are likely to occur. This is the language of the UNGA resolution. There tends to be, particularly where area closures impinge on existing fishing operations, uh, a rather high uh, bar uh, uh, of proof that there are VMEs down there uh, before, uh, in some cases, the uh, Regional Fishery Management Organization will act. And in the end, there's widespread unsustainable exploitation of deep-sea fish stocks and species. Hundreds of species are taken in these deep-sea fisheries on the high seas worldwide, and very few of them are managed for sustainability. And in fact, we know very little about most of those species in terms of their life history characteristics and the impact of the uh, exploitation or mortality uh, uh, on these species from fishing. These are just a couple examples of the maps produced by the Marine Conservation Institute that we have in our report that we'll be, uh, we'll be releasing next week. And then again at the uh, BBNJ or the PREPCOM 2 meeting at the United Nations at the end of uh, August and the beginning of September. This is the area of the Northwest Atlantic, which Dave, David Freestone mentioned. And you'll see um, the red areas are areas that have been closed to bottom fishing to protect deep sea ecosystems. The green areas are basically the areas at, with at fishable depths, meaning below or uh, shallower than 2,000 meters, which is the maximum depth that fishing takes place in these areas, where fishing is allowed to occur. So you see there has been some significant area closures, but still there are a lot of areas uh, that remain open to the bottom fleets, uh, and most of the uh, fishing in this area is bottom trawling. Similarly, southeast Atlantic, you get a kind of a picture of um, areas that have been closed in red, areas in green are those areas that are, are technically open to fishing, and the thatched or hatched areas are areas at fishable depths. <clears throat> now what is the relevance of these UN resolutions to the unclosed implementing agreement negotiations coming up? Well, these resolutions were designed to implement key provisions of the United Nations Fish Stocks Agreement, um, particularly in Articles 5 to 6 five and six of that agreement that require states to operate on a precautionary basis or apply the precautionary approach that requires states to conduct impact assessments of fisheries on straddling stocks and highly migratory fish stocks, including those stocks on the high seas, to protect biodiversity in the marine environment and to protect habitats of special concern. Um, the UN Fish Stocks Agreement is the second of the UNCLOS implementing agreements. And so it, it features the, with the, the, the current negotiations underway for a third uh, implementing, implementing agreement. And a number of its provisions and the UNGA resolutions are, are directly relevant to the implementing agreement negotiations, in particular those components that would establish closed areas, um, um, a very strong parallel with marine protected area uh, protected areas, a, a major element of the uh, negotiations underway for the third implementing agreement, and environmental impact assessments. And in terms of the complementarity or the synergy or the relationship, the new implementing, implementing agreement could complement, build on, and enhance effective implementation or compliance with the United Nations Fish Stocks Agreement, and again in particular its uh, elements or obligations related to protecting habitats of special concern and biodiversity in the marine environment and to conduct the impact assessments of, of, of fisheries, in this case bottom fisheries. Um, and very similarly, we also in the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition work on deep sea bed mining. Uh, this is a picture of the Clarion Clipperton zone. Um, there are major questions, and I'll go through this quickly, just a couple slides, about whether in mining this area it's possible to restore or remediate damage that would be caused to deep sea uh, environments uh, in that area and elsewhere. Um, and the a regulatory regime for the commercial exploitation of minerals in the Clarion Clipperton zone and elsewhere in areas beyond national jurisdiction is now currently uh, under development by the International Seabed Authority. And again, major elements of that regulatory regime will be relevant to the implementing agreement negotiations, particularly. Uh, the closed areas or areas of particular environmental interest, as they're called in, in, in relation to the mining regulations, uh, strategic environment management plans, 
uh, environment management uh, environment management assessments or impact assessments and management plans, uh, etc. And of course, because of the potential for irreversible harm, we're calling for clear conservation objectives to be established in this regulatory regime and precautionary management, uh, given the, uh, the potential damage that could occur. So I'll leave it with that. Um, just a set of publications on uh, the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition. You can go to our website. And thanks to all those, including many of you on the call, uh, and I presume and hope many of you that are listening, uh, for your help and support for the work we've been doing over the last 10 to 15 years. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, again, a, a quick note for our audience, if you have any questions for any of our speakers, you can type your questions in the question box in the webinar control panel on your screen. And we'll get to questions in the Q&A portion of the webinar uh, in a few minutes. Uh, next up is Duncan Curry. Uh, Duncan is political and legal advisor to the High Seas Alliance and Deep Sea Conservation Coalition. He has practiced international environmental law for over 30 years and lately has focused on the oceans. He attends BBNJ meetings and gives workshops to BBNJ participants and also attends the International Seabed Authority and regional fisheries management organizations in the South Pacific and South Indian Ocean. This is Duncan Curry. Yeah, thank you and uh, hello everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I'm going to be talking about the uh, principles and guiding approaches uh, with a view to ha having a look at what kind of principles and approaches can be included in the implementing agreement or the instrument uh, when it's de developed. Firstly, uh, why do we need principles? Well, they systematize regular rules within the legal system, um, they elaborate the principles and set out measures concerning the rights and obligations of states, they set out the normative frameworks for innovations, and they provide guidance for the interpretation and application of the rules within the conventions, as well as set out the ways that uh, the objective of the agreement will be achieved and the context for the rules. So they are important, and you do see them in many, many international agreements. And that's why um, I've referred to the CARES overview. The chair is Eden Charles. You see in the top right-hand corner of the slide there from Trinidad and Tobago. And he issued, uh, a, I think in May, an overview of the first session of the PREPCOM. And if you click on the link, you'll get to that. And there he outlined, outlined some guiding approaches and principles. Um, and as far as approaches go, he noted that UNCLOS, the Law of the Sea Convention, provides the general principles for the international instrument. The Fish Stocks Agreement, which Matt and others talked about, and particularly in Article 5, contains a lot of principles, as does the Biodiversity Convention. And other print guiding principles as well as uh, guiding approaches include, and he listed a, quite a number. And I've collated some of the guiding approaches into a table here. And here I've actually taken um, Ambassador Charles's summary and, and just tried to allocate them into, into different um, columns. And I won't go through them because of time, but you'll see that uh, there are some uh, correlated approaches, balances between rights and obligations, balances between conservation and sustainable use, and balances, balances between the rights and coastal states and others, uh, the concepts of due regard for the rights, duties, and interests of states under UNCLOS, as well as for the coastal states um, and, and states near the high seas areas, and the rule of law, cooperation and coordination, and fairness underpin it, as well as the concepts of equity, and there they've mentioned equity, equitable utilization, and intergeneration, intergenerational equity, as well as the idea of no domination by corporate interest. And finally, um, talking about common but differential responsibilities, which has been brought up, but also probably more appropriately, the idea of no, no disproportionate burden of conservation and the management of ocean resources, and attention to the needs of developing states, particularly LDCs, landlocked countries, and SIDS. The reason I say that is because the concept of common but differentiated responsibility doesn't easily sit with UNCLOS. It was distinguished by the Law of the Sea Tribunal in the Seabed Mining Advisory Opinion, uh, which really said it had no role. And I think most states do tend to accept that it's, it's better um, placed in, the, in the, the way that they've been described in the two right-hand columns. Also very important is capacity building, uh, technology transfer, good ocean governance, and the idea of cooperation and coordination with bodies and organizations. 
Turning to principles, I won't list all of these because I'm going to talk about them pretty soon, but just by way of um, background, you'll see um, in the um, papers published for the first PrepCom, uh, there's a paper I wrote together with my assistant, and what we did there was we actually went through the multinational environmental agreements as well as the uh, fisheries agreements, the RFMOs and so on, and tried to extract on a really sort of an abstract basis what principles can be used to underpin the implementing agreement. And so some of these are listed here and, and it was quite, I think, gratifying that many of them were either picked up or, or reflected by a lot of states parties. So turning to the first one, the protection and preservation of the marine environment, um, and you'll see, I won't go through these because of time, but we formulated that in, this, in the in protection and restoration of the health, productivity and resilience of oceans and marine ecosystems, and maintenance and restoration of their biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. And to, to highlight here that it is important to add a specific layer about the protection and preservation and restoration of biodiversity, as well as a layer about the marine environment. So therefore, we're not just parroting what's been used in the past by states, but we're saying this is particularly important um, to talk about biodiversity and also to talk about restoration of biodiversity, as well as obligations to maintain and restore ecosystem integrity. So trying to re reflect what the scientists have been telling us over the last decade or so. Uh, cooperation, um, we formulated that as ongoing cooperation between and among states to achieve the purposes of the agreement, and there I've listed various uh, places that the cooperation has been used, the Law of the Sea Convention, the Rio Principle 7, and in what's called the MOX case, a, a case for the International Tribunal for the War of the Sea, which has been reflected since then in the Malaysia versus Singapore case. And it's simply there to, to observe that cooperation is the heart of, of this international instrument, or it will be, and that cooperation, transparency, uh, accountability all go hand in hand and to highlight the concept of enhanced cooperation and that's how can this international instrument bring about really enhanced cooperation between states, between states and regional fisheries management organizations, regional regional seas organizations and so on and, and, and the respective um, organ sectoral organizations such as the IMO and the um, and so on. Uh, science, um, use of the best available scientific information, um, probably no um, surprises there, um, drawing on the Fish Stocks Agreement and the Law of the Sea Convention, and particularly in this, for this agreement, what is important is the conservation and sustainable use of marine genetic resources, as well as the technology transfer and capacity building. So science underpins all of those, and these really are, are at the heart of the agreement. Stewardship, now this is an interesting concept because when we talk about the law of the sea convention in the deep sea, quite often we, we look at the um, seabed mining principles, the part 11 principles, where the common heritage of mankind is mentioned. And there is an ongoing debate within the BBNJ as to how applicable or whether the common heritage of mankind is applicable. But um, what I've tried to do here is draw out the concept of stewardship, so not to get involved in the common heritage debate um, as to whether, it specific, specifically the question is whether the concept is applicable to uh, marine genetic resources as opposed to minerals, but really rather to talk about the idea of stewardship and stewardship of the global marine environment, all of it, for present and future generations. So to bring in the ideas of accountability, stakeholder participation and corporate responsibility. The precautionary principle of course needs to underpin it um, and we look there at the Rio Principle 15 um, and it was specifically stated to and, and the lost seabed advisory opinion to have been incorporated in a number of international treaties and agreements. And uh, yeah, so simply we, we need to reflect that um, in the, the Rio Principle 15 in the agreement. Ecosystem based management also very widely accepted, and I've cited some common formulations the CBD decision 5 6, that's COP 5, the Reykjavik Declaration, the JPOI, and so on. Um, the idea of sustainable and equity, sustainability and equity, and specifically the sustainable and equitable use of marine life for the present, for the benefit of present and future generations. Um, I call on there. I, I looked at Rio Principle Four, and in the International Court of Gabscovo Nagimoras decision, 
um, and yeah, and it's obviously at the heart of this agreement. And finally, I think good governance, uh, good environmental governance, including transparency. And there I've listed the, what a, uh, the so-called three pillars of transparency, access to information, public participation, and access to justice or to review procedures, as I, as I call it here. And drawing on here the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Stockholm Declaration, and of course Rio Declaration Principles 10, and, and the Aarhus Convention um, on Public Participation, which really sets out the best international best practice. And the Pluto Pays Principle, uh, the OECD uh, formulation is probably the most widely used, and this, I think, quite pleasingly um, enjoyed quite a lot of support, at least in the first platform. And respect for the law of the sea, uh, David Beeson's written about this and called it the conditional freedom for the seas, which is really the other side of the same coin. Um, and so the, um, that it gives equal rights to the rights and responsibilities of states undertaking activities in the high seas. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Duncan. All right, now we're going to jump back to Christina Jurdy to talk about the potential role of MPAs within the UN Treaty. Uh, and again, audience members, if you have any questions for our speakers, you can pop them into the question box. We already have a number coming in, number of them coming in, um, and we'll get to them during the Q&A portion of the webinar. This is Christina. Hi, it's a pleasure to be back with you all. Thank you all for hanging in there and to our sponsors for organizing this. Um, this is indeed a true download of information. I thought it might be helpful to sort of launch in with this flying fish into what marine protected areas could actually look like within the, the new international instrument or the treaty. As you may recall, we, we talked about sort of the need for the wider framework that um, our colleagues have been talking about in terms of really shared responsibility, the governance principles that Duncan Curry was talking about, the biodiversity integrated into decision making that Matt and David Freestone were talking about, how do you get some of these sectoral organizations to provide an equal priority, equal basis for ensuring the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. But here we're going to skip down and start talking about if you could design a, net, a framework for marine protected areas, what might it look like? Well, the good news is that we don't have to start from scratch. We even have one of the key elements is what are your priority places to protect? The Convention on Biological Diversity has been, since basically 2008, 2010, spearheading a series of regional workshops to try to identify areas that meet these so-called criteria for ecological or biologically significant areas. And this is a map of what many of these places um, are. I mean, yes, they are indeed very large scale, taking up the entire um, North Pacific transition zone. These are not meant to be marine protected areas, and they're not sold as such. But they do at least provide a first glimpse of areas that are in need or may be in need of further protection and to start targeting our efforts here. And of course, you can see the Sargasso Sea is included in the mix. But there are also many others um, lesser known. That's, um, so in terms of building a framework for marine protected areas under a new international legally binding instrument, some of the key components would, of course, be an agreed definition, trying to create the um, objectives, criteria, and so on. And that's what I'm going to be spending the rest of my few minutes to talk about today. With respect to the definition of marine protected areas, again, I'm plugging the Census of Marine Life map. Um, many of these images are indeed still available on the Census of Marine Life website. But what we have is a definition that's been used for decades that was originally um, put out by IUCN and is really meant to be focusing in on those specific areas that are dedicated and managed to achieve the long-term conservation of nature. They stand apart from other sectoral measures because they are actually aimed to protect all the features of conservation importance within their boundaries as John Day and others have noted in guidelines for applying the IUCN protected area management categories. Um, this also means including the overall health and diversity of the ecosystem, and most importantly, to have a stated primary aim to this effect. So it's just not a casual fisheries closed area, not, none of this is casual, but a fisheries closed area that may be 
established to cover two years or five years or may need to be approved by consensus at every meeting. Thus, in terms of objectives, we do have globally agreed objectives already through the Convention on Biological Diversity established in 2010 at the so-called Aichi objectives for Nagoya, Japan. Target 11 talked about by 2020, conserving at least 10% of coastal and marine areas, but importantly, not just individual marine protected areas, but looking at ecologically representative and well-connected systems of marine protected areas. Each individual um, marine protected area may have its own um, objective. That was, and again, if you look at what IUCN has done in terms of its protected area categories, at least it sort of tries to divide between um, sort of strictly protected areas in terms of the nature reserves and wilderness areas that are truly set aside as long-term monitoring reference and ecosystem preservation zones that are in fact in many ways the most um, secure and the most sure of gaining the benefits that you're targeting, but also areas that start to integrate various levels of human use all the way down to category six, which does indeed envisage some level of sustainable use, but as originally um, elaborated, meant small-scale artisanal use. Thus, in terms of criteria, we've already discussed the concept of the ecological and biologically significant areas. So one option is simply to use these EBSA criteria, which were in fact elaborated in 2008 on the basis of a pre-existing um, survey of all the sets of criteria that were out there from national governments, regional seas organizations, as well as the sectoral organizations such as the International Maritime Organizations, particularly sensitive sea area, as well as comparing it with the vulnerable marine ecosystem criteria. In terms of representative networks, well again, we do have a useful a template for what networks might actually contain. And this, of course, was adopted along with the EBSA criteria to include, of course, EBSA, as you want to make sure you're including your, your significant areas, but you also need to be including sites that are just simply representative of variety of habitat types. This is what has been done in Australia, New Zealand, and other places to ensure that you are actually managing to maintain ecosystem processes, functions, and structures of which we may know and understand less about. The connectivity criteria is very important in terms of trying to capture these um, migratory corridors. There's also larva flows. Replication, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. Adequacy, you want to make sure that they are um, sufficient size in order to stand alone, but recognizing that they're also connected to the wider world. So you have both criteria for MPAs per se, but also the need for focusing on the larger realm. In terms of who is actually making the decision and what kind of management measures are being adopted, a fairly straightforward way to be doing it is to have a conference of parties that would be responsible for adopting particular MPA proposals, supplemented, of course, by a scientific commission and proposals um, submitted by various governments on these areas that need consideration. The management measures can be a mix. The conference of parties, the state's parties to the agreement, have the powers inter se to adopt measures specific to a marine protected areas that may indeed address various sectoral activities. But at the same time, through consultation processes, during the um, review of the proposal, consideration of the proposal, and even afterwards, you would want to be encouraging and indeed urging the um, CIOs as the competent international organizations to adopt measures as well so that these measures could be binding on non-parties to the implementing agreement. And so you would have a coordinated effort to ensure that states' parties to the agreement are adopting and implementing these uh, measures amongst themselves, and that non-parties also feel very much engaged and involved in the process of doing it. In terms of levels of protection for marine protected areas, again, many would prefer that they all be no-take. Others would prefer that they all be open to fishing and shipping activities. 
Um, what you're trying to get are to activities that may undermine the objectives of your specific marine protected area. And of course, if your objective is long-term conservation and preservation of these ecosystem structures, you may want the area to more, be more strictly protected than not. In terms of implementation and monitoring, what you're looking at is trying to devise a, a framework that includes and encompasses all of the relevant organizations, gives them all an important role to play, but at the same time is ensuring that conservation is billed with equal priority to the sectoral activities. Otherwise, you will continue to have the process where it's the left-hand side that's saying, please protect, and the right-hand side that can choose to protect or not. There's no leverage, there's no real incentive to cooperation. Again, that needs to be got, done through the state's parties to the agreement. That was, and then in terms of um, bringing it all together, where exactly can we start to go? Just the elements that um, I would recommend uh, is, of course, you need a global framework, approaching it on a regional basis or a case-by-case -case basis for marine protected areas is not going to be achieving the purposes that we really would like this agreement to strive for. Um, in my view, we're actually trying to build on pre-existing obligations under the um, UN Law of the Sea Convention. States have specific obligations to protect and preserve rare and fragile ecosystems, the habitats of threatened endangered species. They have obligations under the Convention on Biological Diversity to um, ensure the protection, ensure that their activities don't harm areas beyond national jurisdiction. So it's difficult to see how building on these obligations can be perceived as undermining the activities of other agreements because their members are indeed already obligated to help fulfill these global goals and objectives. Much of this can be done through defining and refining the duty to cooperate and establishing globally agreed objectives, criteria, and guidelines as I've outlined above. And of course, for the MPA management measures, a mixture of what can the state's parties do themselves and what can be better done through a competent international organization with many avenues for cooperation in between. And then finally, a regular review of implementation. How are we doing? on building towards our, our system of marine protected areas, what are the obstacles that some countries may be facing in terms of implementing their obligations, do they need help, do they need more stringent forms of encouragement, how can you work within the system under the law of the sea convention to actually build on existing obligations and to achieve what it is we're all trying to achieve. I hope I've left you with room for lots of questions. For those who would like some specifics, there is an IUCN matrix that goes through various elements of the implementing agreement, including on area-based management tools and marine protected areas that I'm happy to steer you to. This is the website. And of course, others have also provided material and article coming out, and I'll just squeeze in that Greenpeace has also done a um, nice series of recommendations. 10 steps that goes into much further detail than I could at this time. With that, I'll say thank you very much for your attention. Signing off. Thanks very much, Christina. Um, and we have one final presentation before Q&A. We're hopping back to uh, Peggy Callis uh, to discuss what happens now going forward. And again, uh, audience, any questions you may have, you can put it in the question box. We'll have maybe about um, 15 minutes for questions. All right. Uh, Peggy. Thanks again, John, and, and, and uh, yes, thanks everyone for sticking here with us, and I won't be long. I just want to uh, touch uh, touch on, a, on the next PrepCom and, and what we expect to be discussed in that, um, and so that we'll have time to for, for, to address questions that I'm sure many have after all these, these great presentations by my colleagues. Um, so the, the next PEPCOM, as I mentioned earlier, is scheduled to take place at the end of August, August 26th through September 9th. Um, and as uh, Duncan mentioned, uh, again, I'm sorry, I'm having just terrible trouble scrolling through my, um, uh, my PowerPoints. So just if you can bear with me to get to the right one. Um, hmm. I thought I had fixed it, but it's not. Okay, so so thanks again. And so um, Dun Duncan also mentioned this, but um, 
Uh, following the first PrepCom in April, uh, the chair of the preparatory committee, Ambassador Eden Charles from Trinidad and Tobago, um, provided an overview of the first session, which identifies a uh, non-exhaustive list of issues raised during the first session. And he also provided a roadmap, which sets forth the plan for the next PrepCom. And in that, he provides uh, that where there's a general convergence of views on different issues, these issues will be set aside or parked for the time being to allow time for other topics that may require further discussion. And in the over overview, the chair also provided Annex 2, where he identified areas that he felt had reached possible convergence, as well as those areas where more discussion and uh, clarification are needed. And if you'd like to see this full overview, it's provided on the Division of Ocean and Law of the Sea website. Uh, the link is there on the screen. Um, and uh, there isn't enough time to go into all those issues, but I will just touch on uh, on, on MPAs, um, while there seems to be convergence on the importance of area-based management tools and MPAs, the chair noted that there is a difference of views on the level of protection to be accorded MPAs, for instance, whether they might be multi-use or fully protected areas, and what would the mechanism look like to establish MPAs, and whether that would be a global or regional approach or a combination of both. Other issues that will need to be addressed include those related to monitoring, control, surveillance, and the enforcement of marine protected areas. And in, addi in addition to the four working groups that he established, that, that are already established under the PREPCOM, the chair will also establish a new working group that he will chair on cross-cutting issues. These might include guiding approaches and principles, scope, definitions, governance structure, liability and dispute settlement, and final clauses, such as entry into force and whether reservations will be allowed. And um, I just wanted to touch on upcoming meetings where, uh, here. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm just, uh, this is not cooperating with me. <laughs> upcoming meetings, all right. So apart from the PrepCom meeting, High Seas Alliance members are working on a number of policy briefs for the next PrepCom, and you can check our High Seas Alliance website where those will be posted as we get closer to the next PrepCom. Um, we'll also be involved with workshops both around the UN and regional capitals, and we will be raise, raising awareness on the negotiations at Ocean Related Fora taking place, and some of the one the, the big meetings taking place just in the next two months include um, the International Marine Conservation Congress. I think Christina mentioned that taking place uh, mm -hmm. later this week in New Finland. Um, we have the review on bottom fishing res resolution implementation taking place uh, next Monday and Tuesday at the UN headquarters. And Matt Gianni and the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition will be in force there. Um, following that at the UN headquarters will the UN ad hoc regular process on state of the marine environment. Also um, the IUCN World Conservation Congress taking place in Honolulu from September 1 through 10. And there is a resolution um, uh, being presented and voted on uh, at that Congress uh, for states to support this new um, agreement. Um, and there is also the Our Oceans Conference taking place in Washington, D.C. in, in mid-September. Um, I just wanted to raise that this is a very historical time to be part of what could be a game changer for the ocean. Uh, but we do need to keep the pressure on world governments. And hopefully you'll, you'll continue being interested in following us on our social media and on Twitter and, and stay tuned through our updates on our website. Um, and uh, thank you. I hope you're part of our wave of change. Look forward to some questions. Excellent. Thanks, Peggy. And thank you to all our presenters. That was, that was a whirlwind of, of uh, invaluable information. And uh, I agree, it's a very exciting time uh, in this field uh, with a lot going on and a lot of promise. Um, and I, I hope that folks in the audience are inspired and, uh, and ready to get involved uh, in in ways that they can, uh, and actually that uh, the first the first question in our Q and A is along that line: uh, How can outside institutions, including folks in the audience, 
help at the national or regional level in the work to build a strong UN agreement. So I'll just quickly uh, take a crack, and others can can chime in. But I'm not sure um, if, if if that question is is posed from someone representing an NGO or just as an individual. Um, we work with a lot of different um, regional uh, non-governmental organizations, and so for those of you that are members of of different uh, NGOs around the world, um, we would we would. Um, love your support in, in, in um, getting involved and reaching out to your community leaders and to raising awareness just within your own um, uh, networks. I, I think this issue is one that often it, it doesn't really resonate with the, the broader public because it's really um, difficult uh, treaty issues, but, but yet it's so important for, for other voices to be heard. Can people hear us? Yes. Yes. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. This is Duncan. Yeah, just to add that uh, many countries um, will have consultations with their governments, um, and you know, many, many governments send primarily their environment division or the foreign affairs division. And uh, yeah, I think it's really important that these governments feel the support um, from their own countries, and uh, so not just a New York based process, but it's a process which is strongly supported from capitals, and also things like uh, writing blogs, um, I, I think are really helpful, support on social media, retweeting, the High Seas Alliance has, a, um, has an account and so on, and we, and we, we try to uh, tweet out um, events during the course of the, uh, the meeting in particular, and you know, retweeting those is, is always a good I think, idea or a good way of getting information and getting the word out. Thank you. And I'll just chime in, if you're interested in providing any scientific, legal, or um, management expertise, of course, you're welcomed in many of the different organizations. Excellent, thanks. Um, just a quick note for the audience. Uh, we recognize that, that some of the slides uh, near the end of, of the webinar went a little bit quickly with, with URLs on them, and, and some folks are interested in those. We will be um, uploading a handout with background information uh, on the uh, on this issue and on the talks, and also um, the recording of this webinar will be provided on openchannels.org within an hour after the webinar. Um, if you want the the link, if you want the link to that uh, recording uh, sooner rather than later, rather than having to keep an eye on the website, you can send an email to ebmtools at natureserve.org uh, for that link, and we'll send it out to you. Thanks. Um, um, John, and I think the handout is, is is already posted. Are people able to access that handout in the I user interface? A, Does it show I, uh, I took a look a few minutes ago. I didn't see it on the current webinar page, but it will be on the archive page. Okay. All right. Uh, we have a question on definitions, uh, which I know uh, can sometimes be a thicket, um, but the terms conservation and sustainable use are mentioned in the title of the future instrument under UNCLOS. Do these terms, conservation and sustainable use, have a specific meaning in the context of ABNJ or for the purposes of the treaty? Also, is sustainable use interchangeable with sustainable development? Uh, let me have a, a go at this and other people can try to chime in. I'd like to just address the second part. And the sustainable development goals um, do have um, the SGTG 14, which is, I think, a, a very important um, goal. And I think that um, something that uh, we need to keep, keep a close eye on is about life below water and, uh, and, and, in particular, to conserve and sustainably use the ocean, seas, and marine resources. So. There we have an international um, agreement about the importance of, of conservation and sustainable use. But I want to emphasize that it's, it's sustainable use, not sustainable development, because personally I, I'm, I'm skeptical of the concept that you can sustainably develop the oceans, which is a different concept. But, but sustainably use is, is very well entrenched. And I think um, with, with respect to the the underlying concept, um, you know, the, I think what, what really does underpin this is Article 192 of the Law of the Sea Convention, which states that states have an obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment. So I think that's um, what we always look to as at the founding level as to what we do 
term. But what, what we are trying to do is we're trying to move the law forward. We're not necessarily looking backwards, we are also trying to look forwards. Any other comments on definitions? All right, uh, next question. How, this is a political one. How can the states that are non-parties to UNCLOS participate without compromising their historical reservations? David, do you want to take a stab? Yeah, okay, I will, yes, certainly. Uh, I think this is, we, we, heard, we heard from Peggy that um, uh, that uh, Ambassador Eden Charles himself will be chairing the view, the, uh, the working group or the, uh, the sessions on, on cross-cutting issues. This is a classic uh, cross-cutting issue. Um, one of the issues they have to decide is whether um, the states which are not parties to the Law of the Sea Convention can become parties to the implementing agreement. Well, we've got two, two precedents for this. The 94 agreement, which was on seabed mining, where you had to become a party to the Law of the Sea Convention to become a party to the implementing agreement, and that's the other way around as well. Uh, but the 95 Fish Docks Agreement actually has a provision where, uh, which makes it open to non uh, parties as uh, non parties to the Law of the Sea Convention, to the 82 Convention. And one of the countries that's most obvious is the United States, which is not only a party to the uh, to the 95 Fish Docks Agreement, plays a very active role in, in the uh, development and uh, uh, and review of it. So, so I think the, the I think it's very likely that uh, that the that, that that this third implementing agreement will actually have a similar provision. So, by becoming a party to the implementing agreement, you would not necessarily mean that you would have endorsed all the principles of the Law of the Sea Convention, only those which are relevant for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity in areas beyond, beyond national jurisdiction. Thanks. Any other comments? I would just say that many non-parties to the Law of the Sea Convention are already active members in the discussions, and it's not really any um, impediment to being involved, and I don't think it's intended to exclude non-parties. And I think because this area deals with the areas beyond national jurisdiction, it doesn't have to imply acceptance of the more difficult situation of territorial delimitations. All right, thank you. Uh, this is, this uh, next question uh, gets at the, the, uh, the fundamental power of UNCLOS. Uh, assuming that a new biodiversity treaty would be established directly under or alongside the Law of the Sea Convention, and noting that Despite the, uh, the recent tribunal's finding that China is in violation of UNCLOS, uh, and China nevertheless says it will not recognize that finding, how realistic will it now be to implement or enforce such a treaty uh, when one country, which has already ratified the Law of the Sea Convention, can violate such a treaty with um, seeming impunity? Uh, I have a chat shot at that as well, if you like, David Freestone. Um, I'm sure that uh, others will have comments as well. But first of all, let's let's make the point that uh, the Law of the Sea Convention is really unusual in that it has compulsory dispute settlement. So the fact that uh, the, the dispute between the Philippines and China, which the question relates to, which relates to the South China Sea, is actually unusually important because it actually pro has provided an opportunity for the uh, for, the, for the arbitral tribunal in that case to lay down some really important interpretations of the Law of the Sea Convention. The fact that China has refused to recognize the jurisdiction of the tribunal that is regrettable, but it doesn't actually undermine the importance of the award which was made in that case, which is very wide ranging. Right, so having said that, most treaties, and you could say click, you could use the Biodiversity Convention or the Framework Convention on Climate Change, do not have similar uh, in, um, a dispute settlement, a compulsory dispute settlement procedures. So the Law of the Sea Convention is way out in front on this, and the fact that, uh, that one particular state refuses to comply or has publicly declared it refuses to comply with rulings on specific issues doesn't undermine the importance of that at all. Uh, so one of the things, again, back to the cross-cutting issues, the working group is looking at that, one of the things they'll have to decide is whether the, whether the compulsory dispute settlement procedure 
will apply to this new convention as well. And I would imagine that they would be quite keen for it to actually apply. But this is, you know, it's cases of this kind. So it's, it's a situation of the exception that proves the rule in most of these circumstances where there are arbitrations and where there are cases before the International Tribunal or the International Court, car parties have actually complied. Very unusual. And I don't think that it undermines the, the value of the, uh, this part of the World Sea Convention, which I hope also will be extended to the, to the new treaty. If that helps. Can I come in with a couple of additional points? And this is Duncan Curry here. Um, firstly, with respect to the award itself, um, it wasn't just about jurisdiction. I think there are some quite interesting findings there um, that fishermen from Chinese vessels engaged, engaged in the harvesting of endangered species, such as turtles, in breach of Articles 192 and 194, as well as the harvesting think, of giant clams in a very destructive way. And so, to my mind, that, that also shows that the Convention does work. Um, again, it's not just about the geopolitical sovereignty aspects, but it just does put flesh on the bones of, of the obligations under the Law of the Sea Convention. And even if China doesn't accept the award, it's still there, and, and I think it's a good example of um, a, a, an award under the, under the Law of the Sea Convention. But secondly, to observe that um, I talked a little bit in my presentation about enhanced cooperation, and I think what is really important, uh, and a really important part of the of the new agreement, will be cooperation, and that's it's intended to really get. I think cooperation, get enhanced cooperation, get states to agree before it gets to the dispute stage. And, and I think that's really, really important. Um, and I think this, the institutional mechanisms will be very, very important in that regard um, to try to, what we're trying to do is actually improve the functioning of the international system. And I would just pipe in, indeed, one reason for having a regular meeting of the Conference of Parties is to be able to address issues before they arise. And of course, even non-parties would be able to attend, air their issues and concerns, and hopefully it's all done in wide transparency, participation, and due consideration of the interests of other states. So you don't get to the disputes um, issue that uh, we are now confronted with. Thanks. That was Christina. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm combining a couple questions here on governance and financing. Uh, how would the governance of of uh, BBNJ work? Do you envision it as a, a standalone institution, or would you deputize the International Seabed Authority? Also, how will this governance and presumably surveillance of high seas uh, be paid for, uh, including presumably um, uh, new technologies to keep an eye on what's going on out there? So I have a go at this one to start with. I'm sure Christina has some comments. I mean, this is one of the key issues which the parties are going to have to decide. Uh, there is a strong lobby led by the Africa group that the Seabed Authority, which is already an established record on um, regulation of, of uh, exploration and exploitation, now coming into exploitation of seabed resources, is an ideally place to actually take on extra roles. So those extra roles would be in addition, it would be like a parallel organization that the Seabed Authority would, would, would have to, 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 to um, absorb. So it would require quite a, a, a lot of changes to the Seabed Authority set up. Um, the other alternative, which Christina just mentioned, is where you have a meeting, say, at the Conference of the Parties, uh, which actually, which is more in the model of the Framework Convention on Climate Change or the CBD, which actually the, the parties come together and take these overarching wider decisions. So that's still an issue to, to decide. In terms of finance, um, the, uh, the the Rio treaties, CBD, Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, Desertification Convention, all will have financial instruments. Um, and this, the Global Environment Facility acts as the natural mechanism of those bodies. And some form of financial mechanism, it seems to me, and many others, would be a very important part of this new agreement so that some of these sorts of activities uh, would actually have an obvious funding source. But that's, again, part of the negotiation. Thanks. I'll, I'll pass. David said en enough. I realize we're getting short on time. <laughs> I can just make one, one comment about the Seabed Authority, and that it is a very 
a small organization under and under a lot of change and a lot of stress. And so I think um, those of us who do attend the Seabed Authority, and we just come back from there last week, are very acutely aware of the real difficulties that both the council and the assembly have to function in the legal and technical commission. So um, while yes, a lot of states are supportive of the Seabed Authority um, as um, a having a role, and this it may have a role, for example, in the marine genetic resource part of it. Um, I think um, there's a lot to be, a lot of water to go under the bridge in that one. And uh, simply, and on enforcement, um, again, I think an important part of enforcement. We've had a long way in enforcement in fisheries. We've, in the, in, in the sense of the um, uh, international satellite surveillance, um, the, the port state marine, uh, the port state measures agreement, uh, the. Um, Examples such as the European Union, IEU fishing regulation. Um, I think you know we have learnt a lot about enforcement, and we can put a lot of these to, um, I think, to bear as well as things like compliance committees. And one of the crucial things is going to be transparency. And finally, on, fin on um, financing is the importance of the um, having some sort of clearinghouse. And, and to mention the again, one of the very important parts of this agreement is going to be the benefit sharing mechanism from marine genetic resources. And again, that clearinghouse, if there's one set up, could have a role, as David said. Excellent. Thank you. And we're having audio uh, difficulties with Matt Gianni, but he has submitted his answers to the question in our chat, which I'll read to, to everybody. Uh, Matt would like to respond to say that it is important to follow through on international legal obligations by working to get these obligations implemented. As I mentioned, the UN Fish Stocks Agreement requires impact assessments, biodiversity protection, and habitat protection. But the state's deep sea fishing <clears throat> on the high seas were not doing this, uh, so we began a campaign in the early 2000s at the UN to put pressure for the implementation of the UNFSA to protect deep sea ecosystems from destructive deep sea fishing practices. We generated a real debate at the UN and political pressure that resulted in the adoption of the series of resolutions I mentioned. We are now working at RFMOs in the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans to get the provisions of the UN General Assembly resolutions implemented and operationalized. Civil society pressure is critically important. Scientists, NGOs, and others all have a role to play. Uh, thanks for that, Matt. Uh, and we we are uh, we've run out of time for this webinar. Uh, the 90 minutes are up. Uh, we received a number of uh, a lot of great questions, and I apologize to uh, people who submitted them. We weren't uh, able to have uh, uh, time to get to everybody, um, but I do want to mention that the handout that I mentioned earlier with background documents is in the control panel for GoToWebinar. That handout is a PDF it's called Protecting the High sea, uh, Seas. You should um, see that in your control panel. So if you're interested in that, you can click on that and download it immediately. It'll also be on the webinar archive uh, page on open channels. And as I mentioned before, uh, if you would like the link uh, sooner rather or as soon as possible to the webinar archive page, you can email Sarah Carr at ebmtools at NatureServe, that's natureserve.org, and uh, she'll send you the link. Otherwise, uh, the archive, the archived uh, video of this webinar will be up on the Open Channels website within the hour. And John, may I just add that some of us have bravely put our email addresses out there, and if you do have some serious questions or would like to engage in discussion, happy to be contacted within reason. <laughs> of course. But thank you so much. That's great. Thanks, Christina. Uh, so uh, with that, we conclude this webinar. I want to thank Christina, Peggy, Matt, David, and Duncan, as well as the MPA Action Agenda team uh, who put together a great uh, slate of speakers and a great webinar. It's been a pleasure working with everybody. And on behalf of MPA News, Open Channels, EBM Tools Network, and, uh, and our partner, MPA Action Agenda team, uh, I thank everybody for being here and presenters for um, for providing us with your information. Thank you. Thank you so thank much, Sarah and, and, and John. And everyone for listening. Bye-bye. Yes. <laughs>